So, now, we've got as long time as, as much time as until George tells us we have to stop. <laughs> and we have the two of us to answer your questions. Oh, is it underneath? Thank you so much. You won't see it there. Okay. Anyone? This lady here in the front. Uh, my name's Becca. I'm a family member. I'm at risk from carcinogens and I'm trying to just think of some groups. Oh, sorry. Let's, we'll wait for We'll get a microphone to anyone who wants to ask a question. I'm a family member at risk and carcinogens. I'm trying to think of what groups and yes. we can talk about some mental health. Um, it's, the words they mentioned twice by yourself, Ben and Jen, by Dr. Libby, um, stigma and shame. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've, I've lived with up until crazily decided to write to Paris on a bicycle and I sent out all my close friends and acquaintances a letter. This is my history and this is my life. And I'd not spoken about it mm. forever. I'm 46 and I'd not spoken to it until about two years ago because I felt ashamed. And you explain that to people and, well, that's ridiculous. Why do you? But it's, it's coming up time and time again. How do we get rid of this stigma and shame? Is it something that we, as HD family members, need to do? with education, with awareness, with, with communicating yeah. with out, outsiders? Or I, is it, have you experienced it? I've done a little bit, Jackie. I work for Britannia Wealth Building Society, um, part of the co-op now. Um, and I started with just my immediate group of people. And it, it was, it was just educating people. Um, at a point when dad was diagnosed, dad would not even tell people. He felt ashamed. I think it's because people don't understand it. When, when I first spoke to people about dad and the impact, they said, oh, it's like Alzheimer's. I was like, ooh, so far off the mark. It, it, I've just started small, and now the department that I work in, um, it's a very large contact centre, they've adopted Huntington's as their charity for this year. I've done an education piece. I've done something like this um, without Charles. It would have been lovely. I'm just telling people what it's all about. Um, I think people feel awkward. I think, and that is why sometimes you as a person may feel embarrassed because the person on the other end receiving that message <laughs> thinks, you've got no hope. How do I speak to you? Me and mum have had people in the street who will cross over from us. They say that they don't know what to say to us, so they prefer to say nothing. We've had people who said to mum, these are people who've known the family for years and years, and they've said, well, isn't it a shame? Wouldn't it be better off if he hadn't had it? Wouldn't it be better off if he wasn't lingering? Don't say that to me. It's, it's education, I believe, Jackie. first year of masters in oral history mm. and I'm hoping to speak to put you on the spot Charles <laughs> he'll give me an interview and um, to speak to people on the Hidden No More um, APPG launch yeah. and what motivated them as family members to, to take away that balloon, to take away that mask, to take away that stigma. I'm hoping that family members will speak to me as part of that oral history and then I'll be able to mm. make the speak on this platform in the future because I think it is important for all of us to tell our incredible Incredible yeah, stories. yeah. That that for those of you who don't know uh, about the APPG, that was um, some two years, almost two years ago now. We launched a, 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 an all-party parliamentary group in Parliament into Huntington's disease, and the purpose of of that is partly the obvious one, which is to try and get representation within Parliament for um, the community affected by this disease and have any legislation that might help that but also what it did was it provided the opportunity for um, us to get a day in the light of the, the sunlight of the press um, which uh, we were able to do we had some 700 people there in front of Parliament uh, all affected in one way or another by the disease and that is precisely the sort of thing that actually, of course, is extremely helpful. Um, because, because of that, we had untold other features that were done all through the press and the media, television and radio and newspapers about the disease. Now, that is extremely helpful. Because basically what we have to do, of course, is just 
make people understand about the disease. The people are afraid of things that they don't understand, they don't know, and that's always been the case. But I'm actually pretty hopeful about this. I really think that this will change. Um, I, I like to think that what is going to happen is what's happened, for example, to, to, to something like um, people in wheelchairs. If you, I mean, I remember as a child that, you know, some 50 years ago now, that, that there was no, no such thing as wheelchair access. It didn't exist. It was never a consideration when you were building a, 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 a building that you had to have people with wheelchairs get into it. Now, imagine, you couldn't even think in Western Europe about putting up a building without wheelchair access. It could not, it just would not even be possible to consider it. Now, look at that sea change that's happened. It's possible, you see, that's happened with wheelchairs. I think that the same thing could and probably will happen with dementia, not specifically just Huntington's disease, but dementia generally, because I think that there's gonna be so many people with dementia that it's gonna be impossible to ignore them. You know, the statistics, of course, are actually quite mind-blowing of the exponential rise as we all get older that by the middle of this century, the, 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 the numbers of people with dementia is just going to be so great that I don't think we're going to be able to shut them away anymore. So I think it will change. Um, but the way, of course, that that will be a eased along will be by as many people as possible standing up and uh, being counted, which is what we have to encourage everyone to do. Another question? So. An endorsement. We like endorsements. <laughs> Tony Wardell from Nottingham, a former branch uh, chairman of the Huntington Disease Association there. Um, just to endorse um, that, that we've, we've got to go um, ahead. Uh, we've got to work as a band together, but also not to forget all the other um, horrible, nasty diseases that affect everybody out, out there. Their families, like our families, get the cold shoulder, as uh, Michelle's um, illustrated. And we've got to get over that. And I believe it's all about fear. People don't know what, uh, uh, they don't understand. So if you get down to education, improve education, and not only education um, about the disease, but also of the care that's needed for these people. I personally believe that each disease has probably a specific care pattern. There'll be lots of things in common, but there'll be things specific for Huntington's disease. And the day that the doctor apologized to me for not speaking to my wife face to face was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bernhard. Uh, Thank you. I uh, would just like to comment on one. As a person who tries to help families with Huntington's disease, I would like to comment on one thing. My impression that I get um, very often is that it's very helpful to be open mm, and to be frank. But I also realize that they're different people. It's not always the right thing for everybody. It also applies for the decision whether to take or not to go for a predictive genetic testing. I think it's important to realize that people are different and everybody needs, and that's the real challenge or one of the real challenges to find out for him or her, herself personally what is the right way for them. So I think it's important to be aware of the fact that everybody needs assistance in that process of finding that out for him or herself, as opposed to suggesting that one size fits all. Do you have anything to add to that? I would just, it's, that just sort of mirrors my experience. I straight away knew I wanted to know for my own personal reasons. My brother, by the same token, knew he didn't want to know, he still doesn't want to know, how you know two people in the same family, we've both been offered all the support, all the information, he's taken his way, I've taken my way. I'm not right, he's not right. We argue that we're not right. <laughs> I say that I'm right and he's wrong. Everybody is different. I think th there just needs to be, personally, there needs to be a bit more of a structure when you walk out with the result. I think it might be worth, um, for those of you who are slightly newer to Huntington's than the others, just giving a little bit of the sort of 
talking specifically about testing a little bit. Bernhard could fix to correct me on this, but I think the figures in Europe are something like 15%, is it, of people who know that they are at risk for the disease who get tested. Now, that may seem low, but it's much lower in the United States. Now, the reason it's lower in the United States is because they do not have the laws of protection that we do in Europe um, with regard to employment and insurance and so on. Um, this is absolutely a, a key matter, which I would say comes, in my experience, comes second only to that of stigma and general fear about the disease, is the reason why people don't get tested. They really are afraid that they're going to lose their job, they're going to lose their insurance, they're going to lose their mortgage, and so on. Um, and they are really valid fears. Um, there is legislation in place to uh, stop that, but of course the it's the same kind of legislation that says that women should not be discriminated against in the workplace and uh, ethnic minorities should not be discriminated against. Now, do we have a perfect system with, those, with regard to those? No, we don't. And so, of course, people, I think, are very aware of that. Um, as regards whether people should be tested, um, I, I'm going to have Michelle's comment on this. I have always said to everyone that I do not recommend that anyone gets tested for the sake of being tested or for the sake of um, being involved in clinical research, which I instantly do absolutely advocate once someone has been tested. What I say is that everyone should get tested for their own reasons. But there really are a lot of very good reasons, um, which a lot of um, primary care workers and indeed neurologists are not actually really aware of when they tell people about the problems of being tested. Um, we probably don't have time to go into all of them now, but I mean, I would suggest that, for example, the, um, the, the, the fact that there are certainly many ways that you can uh, influence the environmentally uh, the uh, onset of the disease with, through lifestyle and so on uh, is unquestionably the case. And more importantly than that, there really are, really are going to be some um, very, very big clinical trials coming up, which I would strongly recommend anyone in my position to be part of. So for those reasons alone, I think it's really worth considering being tested. What, what do you think? Absolutely. I, I think <coughs> everybody's personal circumstances should should make them, lead them to, the, to that decision. Absolutely. Mine, I, w I was single, I've got no family, I've got no dependents at the time. I, I was facing a future with Huntington's on my own. That, that's the way that I, I made the decision. Since then, I'm negative and I've got a partner and I've got Emily now. So, you know, it's all sort of rolled into one. But absolutely, do, do it for yourselves. Don't do it for, for a project. Yeah. Because, as Dr. Cole said to me, you will never, ever again know yes or no. You'll never forget that. But I would say, again, to add to that, once you have tested, get I absolutely wholeheartedly urge people to become involved in clinical trials and all of the rest. It's not just clinical trials, but the whole process of um, establishing biomarkers and all sorts of things to do with the disease. Because it's not just that that's going to advance the science faster. It's just that the more that we, we, we get involved in this collaboration, the more people become less afraid of the disease um, and uh, the more that we can, end, you know, with the quicker we're going to be able to end the stigma which you've talked about. Other question, that lady over there with the parcel. Hi, I'm Catherine Hill. I'm one of the genetic counsellors in Devon. Hello. Um, Michelle, you talked a bit about um, what was done well with your counselling and what could be improved. <laughs> and I wondered, Charles, with your counselling, what the things that were good and the things that we can do better are? In I didn't opinion? have any. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend my experience as something that um, uh, would be a, uh, a flag for uh, <laughs> our health services, unfortunately. I think I, think I kind of somehow slipped through the net. I, I mean, I, I hope that what happened to me wouldn't happen to anyone else um, because I, well, I, don't want, I don't want to, you know, there are people who know the people involved in all this, and it was a. And it, unfortunately, I, I, by my experience, I put quite simply was I went to my GP, said I wanted to be tested. She put me in touch with a neurologist, who 
put me in touch with another neurologist who I went to have the test who told me that I had the disease. And that was it. I mean, not that I had the disease, that I was, you know, being positive. Um, and that was it. <laughs> so, and that is not how to go about it. Um, uh, we, we, do, we do have to... One of the problems that's happened with, with Huntington's disease, and this is changing really, really, really quickly, is that we are, uh, is that we have not really had any kind of really set um, principles laid out as to how to care for people with the disease or how to go through the process of testing. It's all been a bit kind of depends where you live, it depends who you know, it depends what, whether you happen to be lucky enough to know someone like George or you know, people like Sarah Tabuzi, who you'll hear of her later, um, you know, and some people go through terrible experiences with no counselling, no genetic counselling, nothing, um, which is not ideal. Um, I, you know, I think that it's something that we need to strive for to have a uniform um, set of principles of how this should work. I know that there are some principles laid out, but they're not uniformly applied. Um, similarly to that, by the way, on that subject, um, George, I've got a magazine that was just there. Did you pass it to me? Um, there's, uh, I, I, I meant to bring this up, to, up with me, but on, on the subject of um, uh, care, I recommend um, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to buy this uh, uh, as a magazine. You can access it free online. This is this month's copy of Neurodegenerative Disease Management, which is completely devoted to Huntington's disease um, and has um, a... Uh, standard of care um, guidelines that have been um, worked on now for some years by the European Hunting, the EHDN, um, with some really wonderful stuff in there. This is only a starting point, it's going to be worked on, but you can either go to this either by accessing it uh, on uh, what is www.futuremedicine.com, which is the that's one word, futuremedicine.com, and then go, going in just find Huntington's disease or this current one. Otherwise, you can very simply go find it by going onto the HDA website or any other of the major Huntington's websites. You can access this online. It is free. It has been paid for, for as open access, so it's free to access and download and print. And that, for example, is the first time that's happened. Until this happened this month, there was not a single laid down guideline for standards of care with people with Huntington's disease, how to, how to do you know, physiotherapy, dental care, um, diet, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, now we at least have this. Now you see, th this is how things are moving. You know, we, we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll move forward so that people don't go through the process of testing that I went through as well in the same way. And, and you know, th all of this is moving. You're going he to hear some very exciting stuff today from Bernhard, from... Sarah, uh, uh, well, everyone actually today, who are going to tell you about stuff that's really, you know, moving along. We, we're, we are in a, we are in a, in a, in a very changing HD world, and it's great that we are. Do you have anything on that? I mean, don't worry, you don't have to no. say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Any? How are we off for time, by the way? Good. There's a mic. I think one of the big challenges in, in health and social care services is we're so accustomed to that model. That is, we have a client, and this is the focus of us, and even for confidentiality reasons and for all other sort of uh, politically correct concepts, we're not allowed to talk to the family. But I think in Huntington, the big challenge is it doesn't work like that. I mean, we have to deal with, we have to have the package. Even partners and, and parents feel that they are so... Uh, as if they are asking for something they're not entitled to. They're apologetic when they, they talk about their own needs. But I think people working with Huntington's will, need to, will have to appreciate that it isn't just about somebody who's jerking and you know, trying to get the jerks under control. It's much more complicated. The other point is how we label patients. The trouble is, if you don't have convincing symptoms, you're not classed as a patient. And if you're not classed as a patient, you're not entitled to services. And if I start looking after people who are just um, uh, pre-manifest gene carriers, then probably I'll be told off by my managers. We are not uh, commissioned uh, to, to look at, uh, they are not even patients. And, uh, and again, 
Sarah probably will tell us as well, Sarah Tabrizi, about how things develop over years before you have the jerks, before you have the, the implanty movements. It's just it's a couple of big challenges, and it's uh, because of the rarity of the disease. People are not used to this. So if I was a, a doctor coming to this conference, probably what is going in my head is, how can I treat dystonia? Somebody's coming, like, wh which tablet should I give them? Because I don't totally appreciate the complexity around the family, around the children, around relationships, unless I start working with them. Thank you. I, 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 I've oh, sorry, excuse me. which is all a neurocanthocytosis, which is also a, a neurodegenerative disease with many of the symptoms of Huntington's, albeit an earlier onset by and large, uh, mm -hmm. mid-20s, just the time. Uh, I'd like to address the question of acceptance um, of patients and of society of patients. Um, I recall clearly as a child um, visiting some friends who across the road from us had a relative who was locked away in an attic, suffering from some sort of dementia. I have no idea what it was, but it was a common pattern, I expect, in the 40s and 50s, simply to lock away your problems. I think really the opposite is necessary now. Uh, and we have experience in caring for, for a daughter who is really quite seriously affected. And I think it's important for us as carers and for caring organizations to try to bring together the population, the old friends of our, the old school friends of our daughter is a good example, to let them see the humanity behind the disease. And I think in that way, not only do we do a great favor for the patients <coughs> and for the people who've experienced that, but socialize open society in small, in small cases to the, uh, to the reality and to the needs of patients. Yeah, I, I think that, because um, I want you to, to comment on this, Michelle, I think that, that uh, we, you know, we all want these things to, do, I mean, uh, to, to, to happen. And of course, what we do have to you know, remember is the, you know, playing devil's advocate here you know, is the, the difficulties involved. This is not a pretty disease. You know, it's not. And most people with the disease want to curl up on a ball and stay at home, you know. So I think that it's, you know, there are limits to how much we can do, uh, but I think that's why we have to engage as families. Mm. Michelle. Just, just little things, I suppose, for Dad. Um, we, we make sure that he's got a lot of photographs. <coughs> he's got access to, his family have got access to him. Um, he has photographs. We, we have regular meetings. The ward staff obviously know Dad really, really well. We've talked about Dad before the illness and include dad in these discussions. Everybody knows dad was a policeman. <coughs> Everybody knows what dad did when he was a policeman and what a proud man he was. And I think what we need to remember is we're talking to a person and it's not the illness. And I think sometimes people get very, very wrapped up in, he's got Huntington's, it's not your dad. When he's telling me to go away and not so many nice words, it's not your dad, yeah it is. That's my dad, and and he always will be. Whether he's he was hugging me the other day, he told me to go away the other day. So I I, I totally agree. We we've, we've got to remember it's a person, and like Charles says, it isn't pretty, it's not dignified, but it's still my dad, and we, we just need to remember that. I think. One point that I would throw in here as well is regarding. Um, the, what the gentleman there mentioned about the acceptance of this disease. I think one thing that's going to happen as we research, as, as research moves forward, I know, George, you talked about prevalence a little bit, and especially up in the, the work that's being done, being done in Canada and Vancouver by Michael Hayden's organization up there. And the very interesting stuff that's coming out of it, I haven't got time to go into the detail of it, but is that basically, I'll try and do this quickly, if you think of the CAG repeats uh, that uh, David will be talking, telling you all about, that if you have between 37 and 40, uh, 37 and 40, you're considered 37 to 39 inclusive. You are in what's called the gray zone. 40 and above, you have the disease, and below 
36, you do not. And it's, it's actually a lot more complicated than people realize as to how that is going to progress in the future because the important point about CAG repeats is they only go up. Or, or they either stay the same or they, go or they go up. They do not go down. So when you think about that, you'll realize that, of course, a lot of people who are not, a, who are not Huntington's families right now will be in a few generations' time. And the statistics for the number of people who actually can give birth to a child with HD, even though they have no, no Huntington's disease in the family, are quite staggering. And I think they're something like one in 200 from the, from the research that was done by uh, Michael Hayden's uh, organization in, 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 in Vancouver. So when people think, you know, the, this perception about, well, you know, these are these lepers, you know, that, you know, in the corner, who are these people, the Huntington's people, and if we could just all eradicate them or, you know, stop them having children, then this disease will go away. That is absolutely and completely incorrect. It was the foundation of the eugenic movement and Davenport's work in the United States, but it was absolutely founded on total misconceptions about the disease. This disease is dormant in most, uh, very large parts of the population. It's only a matter of time before it's going to express itself, especially in a rapidly aging population. So, you know, I think that uh, the, uh, the point is, that's a whole other story, but the point is this is not the disease of a very small minority that people often portray it to be. Okay, is it uh, okay to stop here? And yeah. uh, thank you very much. That was really great, and I expected that. Thank you.